Hey everybody at Game Show, um, back with another short uh, vloggy subject uh, I wanted to talk about, specifically um, the concept of corruption in game journalism, which is something that I guess I know a little bit about, not because I am corrupt, of course, but because I used to work as a professional working journalist for the Wall Street Journal, and I remember the day when uh, when the, the, the woman who ran Ethics for us pulled in all the young cub reporters to talk about what journalism ethics meant in the context of the Wall Street Journal. So I want to talk about this a little bit because I know it's something that's been on everybody's mind, um, specifically regarding game journalism and collusion and what it means to read something online and know whether or not you should believe it. Here's the thing. There's no set rule for what constitutes ethical behavior for journalists, but there are legal restrictions around disclosure. Um, so ethics, I'm going to split this up into two different pieces in terms of thinking about ethics and then also thinking about disclosure and why this is important. Ethics are what's best for the reader. It's all about trust. Uh, Jay Rosen, who's a professor at, um, professor at NYU, has written that in order to generate trust, a writer must provide enough information to the reader so that he or she can evaluate the reporting and establish a level of verific verification. So the question for you is, what do you need personally in order to trust that someone is delivering the truth, as it were? The big question should always be, is there something at stake? So oftentimes by protecting readers, you as a reporter or a writer will be losing something, losing access, um, losing opportunities, whatever that means. For example, when I used to work at the Wall Street Journal, Nintendo approached me about uh, attending a press event for Super Mario Galaxy. The press event took place in Arizona, and they were going to put people into low-orbit spaceflight, which is not cheap. I was not permitted by the Wall Street Journal to go as much as I would have liked to have gone, and if I did go, I would have had to disclose that Nintendo would have paid for my trip. Now, there's nothing ethically wrong about taking a trip like that, um, depending on your organization, but it would be ethically wrong to not disclose the fact that Nintendo paid for it and then allow the reader to decide um, what they think is right. Now, most news organizations, um, including Killscreen, for example, don't allow uh, reporters to take um, take paid trips, and for good reason. Um, again, the, the, the big uh, the big reason is that you know there would be a level of influence. Obviously, if somebody's spending thousands of dollars to fly you to some place to do something amazing, ostensibly that's going to color your coverage, um, whether you think it does or not. Um, so, um, so really, you know, really ethics is about, you know, what you as a reader need to understand or know in order to trust that someone is giving you a real, you know, an unvarnished opinion of what's happening in the world. So which comes to this question of friendship, which is something that's been bandied about, about whether this idea of whether or not game journalists can be friends with game designers. Well, that depends on what you mean by friends. A friend on Facebook, that's probably fine. Um, maybe attending a party, probably not the end of the world either. Um, loaning them money, that's kind of a different case. Or asking a game developer to be your child's godparent, that's something altogether completely different. Um, but part of what's hard is that there are a lot of these gray areas that are sort of in between that have popped up now. So for example, Patreon, where you're able to give a monthly amount to a particular creative person in order to support their work, or Kickstarter, um, which a lot of you are familiar with, any kind of crowdfunding platform. In those cases, it's probably going to be journalistic institution by institution. So. I might think of Kickstarter, for example, as being more of a transactional relationship, basically a pre-order program, no different from doing like Steam Early Access, for example. But some people might look at it as you are making a public show of support and that's going to bias all of your coverage against it. Again, disclosure is what's key here. All right, so here's the thing you gotta understand about disclosure, is that disclosure is required by law, at least here in the United States. The Federal Trade Commission oversees that. And so, you know, if you're a YouTuber, for example, who's taking money in order to talk about a particular game, you need to disclose that to the FTC, um, otherwise you can get fined. I um, mean, that's for good reason, because advertising is fundamentally different from editorial, and it's good to keep those things relatively separate. Now, there's always gonna be a, you know, a give and, a, you know, a give and take a little bit. BuzzFeed, for example, kind of blurs the line with sponsored content. Um, but you can't not disclose that you're being paid to push a particular product, and then present that as unvarnished editorial. People need to know what something is. What's unique about games is that um, journalism and fandom in the world of games has always been a little bit blurry. So think about Nintendo Power, for example, uh, which was a magazine that was funded by Nintendo and was sort of produced as um, ostensibly a magazine alongside other video game magazines, or the fact that Game Informer is owned by GameStop, the nation's largest retailer. In both of those cases, whether or not those editorial institutions exist as pure editorial is 
Well, I don't want to say it's questionable, but it certainly could be construed as problematic, and it's up to you as a reader to decide what you think um, the right boundaries are, and whether or not you're going to read those types of um, publications because of their relationships to particular advertisers or their parent company. Um, David Auerbach over at Slate recently wrote that game journalism is over, which I thought was a bit strong, um, but I think his general sentiment is true. If you think of journalism as fan service, then yes, um, then game journalism is going to be ending because that type of fan service is going to migrate to places like Twitch and YouTube. But if the point of journalism is to hold up truth to power, then there will always be a place for it. Um, but the act of asking this question about whether or not there is corruption in journalism is absolutely an important one. Um, in The Lost Art of Argument, Christopher Lash has said that we should invert the usual order of an information and debate. He says, this is what he writes, we do not know what we need to know until we ask the right questions. And we can identify the right questions only by subjecting our own ideas about the world to the test of public controversy. Information usually understood as the precondition of debate is better understood as its byproduct. When we get into arguments that focus and fully engage our attention, we become avid seekers of information. Otherwise, we take in information passively, if we take it in at all. One of the good byproducts, I think, of this conversation about whether or not there's corruption, corruption in journalism, which, by the way, journalists being friends does not constitute corruption. That's not necessarily a bad or unusual thing. Um, but this larger question about whether or not, like, what are journalistic ethics as they apply to video games, I think is a really, really important one. The thing that I would recommend is that um, journalistic institutions in the world of games do not sit alone. And so look at NPR's ethics statements. You can look at PBS's public ethics statements. Um, you know, New York Times, for example, has a published uh, ethics statement as well. They have their ombudsman. There are lots of resources for you. If you want to know what type of accountability um, a particular YouTube pundit or uh, a games website should have in terms of its relationship to you as a reader. But I do think the good byproduct is, is that we're actually having this conversation in the first place. Anyway, hash it out in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. Um, again, these are you know kind of like more off-the-cuff episodes, so I can respond to things that are happening in the world of games. Um, obviously, there'll be a new episode next week um, with all the flashy bells and whistles that everyone loves. All right, I'll see you all then.